That's nice. Got Jazz and Mike, thank you very much for um, taking your time out of your schedules to do this. This is, uh, I, I really appreciate it, you know. Happy to help. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I'll, I'll um, kind of scan through the uh, chat room and try to answer questions as best I can or, you know, we don't want to leave questions unanswered. Sounds good. So, uh, Mike, were you wanting to start? Oh, yeah. Are, are we, Harry, are you ready for us to go ahead or do you want to wait a minute? You're good to go anytime you want. Sure. Okay. So, um, thank you all for being here. Uh, I wanted to focus on um, student engagement for uh, my 15 minutes or so, and we want to leave plenty of time for questions. So obviously student engagement is one of the most important things we do in our teaching. I know most of us don't just uh, lecture straight through an entire class session, and um, we probably have a fear that student engagement is going to be pretty difficult in an online setting or even a high flex setting, uh, being able to engage those students who are online uh, relative to the ones who are in the classroom with us. So there are a few things I wanted to talk about um, how I've done engagement in my online teaching before, both in summer classes and how I did it uh, at the end of last semester. Two main things I want to focus on are um, classroom discussions. I'll talk about how I've done them synchronously and asynchronously. And then uh, hands-on activities are a pretty big part of uh, my classes too. And so I'll show you some examples of how I've done those synchronously and asynchronously to get you some ideas. And then I'll end with um, kind of related to engagement, how to not lose students. And sometimes when we go entirely online, it's easy for us to, uh, or easy for some students to just kind of disappear. Uh, so I'll show you some tricks for um, how to keep them engaged. So starting out um, discussions. Uh, one of my class is a discussion intensive class and so obviously discussions are really important for what we do in that class so i want to start out by talking about um, what i do for discussions uh, synchronously so as you all know we uh, will have access to zoom accounts now which are uh, great for discussion um, as we see in blackboard collaborate we can uh, only really see four faces at a time and uh, seeing everyone at the same time is really important for uh, discussions. Uh, other things you can do in Zoom is you can pin people. So um, if you're thinking about class presentations, um, what I did last semester was actually just have people record their own presentations, which is really not the best way to do it. Uh, it's much better when the whole class is there and they can ask questions. So in Zoom, you can actually pin people and kind of have them be the presenter. Um, hand raising and queuing to kind of line up the questions actually works out better sometimes than in-person class discussions because people can really think about the questions they want to ask or the contributions they want to make while they're listening to everyone else feel a little bit more um, comfortable. Um, one of the things that I think is probably the most helpful um, in Zoom and Blackboard does this too is breakout groups. So if you don't want to do an entire big class discussion, which can be pretty difficult sometimes. Uh, it's nicer to put people into smaller groups and they can chat with each other. I'm gonna share a link in the chat right now about how to do breakout rooms in Zoom. So that's the first link I'm putting in there. Then I'm also gonna put another link in here for how to do breakout rooms in Blackboard Collaborate, which is what we're in now. Um, I, I prefer doing it in Zoom. It seems to work a little bit better. There's also some cool things you can do in Zoom too, where you can send um, a broadcast message to all the rooms at once. Uh, so if you want to say like two minutes left to wrap up your discussions, that'll just go out to all the rooms. They'll get a little message at the top uh, of the room. Um, but there's a lot of functions you can do both in Blackboard and Zoom. Uh, in case you haven't done breakout rooms before, I actually want to do that uh, for you real quick now. Uh, I'm going to put all of you into random um, two different rooms so you can see what that's like from the student perspective. And I'll go back and forth into um, both rooms. 
So on Blackboard Collaborate, you just go in that settings over here. On this, the share content side, you can click breakout groups. And you can do this a few different ways. You can customize it and select the people you want into the rooms. You can pick how many rooms you want to do. Or you can just kind of go entirely at random, which is what I'm going to um, do now. You just select randomly assign. So I'm going to click start, and you guys are going to end up in different rooms. And I will hop into each of them for you. Uh, I'm not sharing my screen right now. Cool. Hmm. Actually can't figure out how to get into that other room. I guess you're all with me in the main room now. Uh, yeah, I think we're in the main room and then I see group one and group two with 12 participants and 10 participants. I, I'll join one of the rooms. I can't get myself into those rooms. Just see that Chaz is able to join the other one. Oh, you have to click the door over the participant screens of each of the groups that you want to go into, it looks like. Am I right on that? Mm. Yep. Okay. All right. So I brought everyone back here. There was a request for me to share my screen so I can show you that uh, option here. So I'm going to do that real quick. It might look kind of crazy um, when I'm sharing the screen that I'm looking at. But you can see at least that this side over here is crazy. But if you look on the right side over here, this option right down here, is where you can do the breakout groups. And you just click right here for breakout groups. You can do randomly assign or custom assign to get that working. All right, so uh, with discussion um, groups, I have a few pieces of advice for how to do well um, with those when you're doing it synchronously. Um, and this is kind of pretty similar to what you probably do in class too, but it works the same way in an online setting. Uh, you want to identify some people who are um, kind of the talkative people, um, kind of the, the natural leaders who are going to uh, get those conversations going. Uh, it might take a while for you to figure that out, especially in an online um, setting. But once you do that, it's pretty good to do some uh, custom groups. And you can kind of organize it so that person or those kind of talkative people are in each of the groups. Um, it's really important to uh, switch back and forth between the groups. So you can kind of monitor. Um, what's going on. Uh, you can poll people for their preferences, kind of get a list of who they like to be with um, in each of those groups. So you can kind of set it up with some preferences. Um, but always be open to feedback, and that's what I've seen that makes things work really well. Um, kind of listen to students on what they want to hear. Um, sorry, I'm trying to look at the chat, too. Uh, Jackie's question, I found that the distortion of the screen happens often in Blackboard. Yeah, I don't have an answer for that. Chaz or Harry might. Um, all right, so I also want to talk about asynchronous discussion. So what I use for that is uh, the discussion board and Blackboard. Um, that I actually find to work pretty well. Um, so I also want to share some piece of advice of things that don't work so well and things that you should do to make them work pretty well. Um, so things that don't work so well for Blackboard discussion boards, in my experience, is a question about something that you've already talked about in the lecture. What I end up seeing is they basically just say um, exactly what you said in the lecture. So they shouldn't just be like, tell me about uh, this thing, because I'm not just going to copy basically what you said. Uh, questions where everyone agrees are also not really the best. Um, some of the best discussions I have seen in my uh, classes are things with a whole lot of disagreement. We talk about like the death penalty or criminal justice reform. Uh, in my applied memory classes, and you get a whole bunch of disagreement, and those discussion boards work really well. It's important to set up expectations before <clears throat> about um, kind of disagreeing well with each other, but that's always gone well for me. Um, 
it's important too if you have ones where they can pick different topics that they're all not picking the same topic. Uh, I have one where uh, I let them diagnose different cases of amnesia and, and talk about uh, the portrayal of those cases and different media representations. And then everyone will end up picking like Nemo or Dory from Finding Nemo. So uh, giving them lots of different options, making sure they all don't pick the exact same thing. Otherwise, it's not really a discussion. Um, and then things that you can do to make them work pretty well. Um, responding to at least one post from each person. I don't think you need to respond to everyone, um, every single post, but at least letting them know that you are in there and you're, you're watching and um, you're giving feedback on uh, their comments. So at least one post from each person. Um, there can be quite a bit of misinformation in discussion boards, so really monitoring and making sure that there are errors in there and correcting those errors. Um, Clear expectations for uh, grading uh, is really important. So I do a 0, 1, 2 grading system for each post and expect them to do three posts uh, on Tuesday and Wednesday for my summer online class. Um, and really setting those expectations really clearly, what counts as a, a post that would get two points, what counts as one that would get one, or what counts as like a zero point. Um, and then posting those grades regularly. Seeing some things in the chat room here, Danielle said, how many posts do you typically require? Oh, cool, just answer it. Yeah, so um, in, a, in a summer class, I do about, um, they're required to do three posts per week. They're graded on their three best posts. Um, other couple of little things here. I find it nice to post a picture uh, in Blackboard so they can actually kind of see you when you're doing the asynchronous discussions. So instead of just having the faces like they are up here with not a real face, Actually posting your picture and encouraging students to post their pictures too, it kind of personalizes things a bit more and makes it a little bit nicer. Um, and then uh, last piece of advice for this is always connecting it to class content. Um, so in my lectures, I post like in big red text what the discussion board question is gonna be. So they know like, oh, here's where I kind of want to think about what I want to say. Then they go over to the discussion board and they can post what they think there. Um, all right, so that's kind of all I want to say about discussion boards. Uh, any questions on synchronous or asynchronous discussion boards or anything I missed? All right, we can come back to questions too. Uh, other thing I want to talk about real quick is hands-on uh, activities in class. Sorry, Mike. Oh, uh, Danielle there. asked about yeah. how many posts do you require of students each week? Uh, how many posts each week? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, three required posts each week. Oh, and another piece of advice too is don't do too many uh, prompts for them to respond to. I do about three to four prompts per week because if you do like 10 prompts for them to respond to, you end up getting a ton of distributed responses, maybe only a couple responses for each post. So three or four really concentrates them within uh, individual ones. And Megan said narrow and specific prompts are key, right? Exactly. Um, okay, next thing I want to talk about, and we can come back to other questions on discussion boards, is hands-on activities. So the things I do are, are very specific to my area of specialty, which is cognitive psychology. Um, so the things I'm gonna show you obviously won't apply to your area, but it might give you some ideas of things that you can do. So again, I, I find ways to do this synchronously or asynchronously. So um, I'll start out with the synchronous activity. So when I'm doing an online class, how I get students to actually not just sit there and listen to me lab on like we're doing right now, but to actually do some activities. So I'm going to share my screen and show you just one example of an activity um, that I've done in class. So you should be able to see my screen now. Um, so this is a change blind, and if, if uh, Chaz, if you can't see this, just chime in and let me know. Uh, this is an example of a change blindness task when we're talking about uh, attention and visual perception. So, and this is actually what I do in class too. This is a change blindness task and you wanna try and identify where the difference is in the screen. You're gonna see images that flicker and go back and forth and you wanna try and find the difference between them. And I would do this synchronously in class as they're watching exactly as you're doing it now um, and have them raise their hand when they see the difference. Uh, I can change the speed of, of the mask or the speed of the image flickering to kind of manipulate things and show them how it'll affect uh, their ability to detect the difference in the two images. This one's actually really hard. I haven't found the difference 
between these images yet. Um, but I don't need to spend a lot of time on that. That's yeah. just an example. I kind of feel like you were trolling me just now, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, I other ones are a lot easier to, to find the difference in. Uh, but I can use that to uh, show an example of uh, visual perception and attention and change blindness, and then we can talk about um, uh, how that works. Uh, along with that, I would typically do something like a poll or a hand raising to see um, when people see it, and then we can see like how long it takes and what are the different factors and variables that lead to differences um, in that. Uh, there's a whole bunch of different activities and experiments I do like that. Um, the other one I want to show you is how I do activities asynchronously. Again, this is really specific to my area and probably uh, definitely won't work for yours, but it can give you uh, potentially some ideas. So again, I'm going to share my screen. All right, so what I'm showing you now is a program called CogLab. Uh, this is another one that I use in my cognitive psych class. It has a ton of different experiments. And um, depending on what we're learning that day, I'll have students ahead of class time go in and do an experiment. They also write a lab report on it. Um, let's see what would be a good one. I can show you the uh, visual search task. So here is what the task looks like. Of course, they read the instructions and stuff. But they can do this task. And then the end, they get their data. It's going to be 80 trials. We're not going to do all those. Um, so this is another one on visual perception and attention. And then what I end up doing is getting the data for the whole class. I'm not going to show you the class data because there'll be names in there, but I can show you the global data. I end up getting all this data, and then we end up kind of looking at it. I'll show them the figure of their individual data and the class data. And then um, so they can do the experiment asynchronously on their own. But then during class time, we can actually talk about their data so we don't have to spend a whole bunch of time um, doing the experiment at the same time. Uh, kind of running out of time here. So just one more thing I want to show you. And if there's questions, I can come back to those. Last thing I just want to mention is how to um, not lose students when you're in an online class, again, because they can kind of just disappear when they're not required to be there in person. Ways you can keep track of students in Blackboard, if you're not already aware of this, um, there's in the Grade Center, there's that last activity column, which is really helpful to know when the last time was they even logged into class. So you can just sort that from uh, most recent to uh, farthest away. And if you actually download the Grade Center um, from Blackboard, it'll give you down to the minute and second when the last time was that they clicked on it. There's also a couple other ways you can do this too. For each individual assignment, you can see if they have ever even clicked on it through statistics tracking. Uh, you just need to turn that on when you create the assignment or the document even or the item. And then you can do a, a report from there to see how many times they clicked on it. You can even see like what time, what dates to make sure they uh, have actually looked at the work. And then there's another one too, which is an entire course report, which gets you even more detail. I'm going to put a link in the chat now for course reports. Uh, and you can see a lot more detail about individual student activity in your classes. Um, so if you start to see that some of them aren't doing anything, you can see these details, like when was the last time they even logged on? Had they even clicked on any of these assignments? Um, then once you identify that, then comes the more challenging work of actually getting them re-engaged in the class. Um, really simple, but the thing that has worked best for me is a ton of really annoying emails. Uh, so I'll start out with you know kind of just like a general email about checking in, seeing what's going on. When they don't respond to like three of those, I end up sending an email that's like all caps, all big colors and red and bold, and it actually works. They they respond to those. Um, I've only lost one student in an online class that never ended up responding to anything, but I've had like three or four students just kind of disappear when I send those really annoying big red bold text, million exclamation points. They end up getting back to me. They can kind of see that you're not gonna like yell at them and get them in trouble or something. They just wanna you just want to check and see what's going on. But I don't really have the best advice on how to catch those ones that are slipping through the cracks. Hey, hey Mike. Yeah. Uh, before you um, move on, can you, uh, Heather, Heather Evans Anderson had a question about polls. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to back. I would uh, love to hear here. about polls and collaborate versus Zoom. Does Zoom have to be done in advance of session? Uh, it does not have to be done in advance. Um, it's 
I think a lot easier to do them in advance and it'll kind of save in there. Um, so just ready to go. Uh, I don't really find a huge difference between uh, Blackboard polls and Zoom polls. Um, I think they, they have pretty similar functionality. I know in Zoom you can easily share the results of the poll with the whole class. I'm not really sure if the whole class can see polls in Blackboard. Um, but yeah, it works um, pretty well in, in Zoom too. And one other question um, that was earlier in the chat, Mike, was about engagement, just encouraging engagement in discussion boards and participating in general. Do you have any other thoughts about that? Uh, yeah, in an online setting, it's definitely a lot more difficult to kind of set the, the tone of engagement in my in-person classes. We'll do a whole bunch of things early on with like small groups and stuff to get them comfortable with each other. And I think some of the same things apply in an online setting too. Starting out in, in smaller groups, getting them comfortable with different people in the class, making sure they are comfortable talking to just two other people before they're comfortable talking in front of everyone. Um, so I think maybe starting out with small groups, starting out with different random people in each group so they can um, kind of get to know the individual people in each class, especially if you're um, entirely online. But yeah, I think when you're, I think someone mentioned a while ago, you're having difficulty like uh, getting students to, to say anything. If you're in a Zoom class and you pose the question to everyone and it's like you can kind of see everyone and no one's doing anything, I just go straight to small groups. Um, they always talk in small groups. We kind of have to, it's just like maybe four of them sitting there. Um, so yeah, if you're just staring at them, they're staring at you, just uh, break out the groups and, and you'll get a lot more uh, engagement with each other. Mm. Any other questions I missed or ready for Chaz to go ahead? I'm sure there will be more questions uh, as we go on. And if more questions come in for Mike while after I start, we can switch back and forth. Um, yeah, that was great. I'm happy to jump in now. Cool. Thanks, Mike. Uh, so I'm Chaz Underreiner. I teach here in digital arts at Stetson. And uh, I wanted to talk about particularly making uh, lecture videos and audio and video concerns. Um, so really, there's a couple of important things to talk about. One thing is that, uh, so I have an audio background and I also do video work, so this is kind of my wheelhouse. One of the important things to know is that it's best if you have a different device for every task that you're trying to do. So if you're trying to uh, cast video, like I'm doing right now, you should have a thing that's made for that. So I'm using this thing right here is a USB web camera uh, and it's a 1080p, just like basic HD camera that's plugged into my, um, actually I have like a USB dock over here, but it's plugged in via USB. I have, uh, so my computer, my laptop is right in front of me over here and I'm not using that camera. Uh, so I set up this camera up here um, to be closer to eye level and also just has a better resolution. Um, so the microphone I'm using is actually a little lavalier microphone right here, like you'll see people clip on to their uh, clothes during an interview. And uh, I put it just by my keyboard. So having a separate camera and a separate mic automatically increases the quality of whatever it is that you're doing. Um, so really quick, I want to share my screen. Um, so let me just show you... Dun, dun, dun. I'm just gonna Google some stuff and talk about equipment, which I actually do this a lot with my students. Um, let's see, okay, so I'm just, I just Googled um, webcam and I see that uh, Heather mentioned that Logitech is sold out across the world. That's actually fine. You don't have to use any particular brand. What is important is that it's 1080p minimum. So that means it's uh, uh, 1980 pixels or 1920 pixels by 1080 pixels streaming all the time. That's pretty much the important thing. And you really should get a separate microphone. So if you go to a real audio website like sweetwater.com, which is what we use to buy all of our audio equipment at Stetson, pretty much, and you just search for a USB microphone, there are many, many microphones on here that will get you a much better result, even a better result than if you're using the webcam. So um, one that looks cool to me is this one right here. Uh, it kind of makes, makes you feel like you're on a, like a talk show or something, you put it on your desk, feel all fancy. Uh, it really doesn't matter though, any of these, um, oh, I see that I'm sharing the wrong screen. There we go, okay. So <laughs> you can see my notes. Hope you guys had fun reading my notes. 
Um, here are the uh, USB microphones and pretty much any of these are fine. Uh, and I would really um, just get one hopefully with uh, funding from the university that suits your needs. Uh, the one that I was showing before is this one. I just think it looks kind of cool. Um, let's see. Uh, IT is working on ordering cameras. Kathy says she uses the snowball. It works great. Yeah, that's great. Um, let's see. Can you send me the exact webcam and microphone that I use? Um, yeah, well, so you don't want my microphone because it costs $700. <laughs> uh, so let me take, uh, let me stop screen sharing for a second. So that's one thing is, you know, I'm a I'm an audio professional. So you guys don't need the same equipment that I have uh, for the microphone. You just need a USB microphone that's only does that. If you buy something that combines together, okay, it's a microphone and it's a camera, a lot of the time it's just not going to work as well. But if you have separate devices, they're just higher quality is the basic principle. Um, let's see. Uh, so I won't recommend my my microphone actually, but I'll, uh, I, can, I can do a little bit more research and send you guys something that I think works. Um, let's see, let me keep going here. So it's also important that you have a solid connection. Um, so make sure that your Wi-Fi is giving you or whatever is giving you as strong a signal as possible for your internet whenever you're doing even a group meeting like this or if you're meeting with students. So if you're having some Wi-Fi issue at home, you should take care of that as soon as possible. Uh, it's really, really helpful for you and for your students. Um, let's see. So I also wanted to talk about some different platforms that the university gives us to do video recordings. Um, so we have access to Blackboard, obviously, right now. Uh, we have access to uh, QuickTime, um, OBS, and Ensemble Anthem. I think the one that I'm basically going to recommend to all of you are either Blackboard or Ensemble. Um, so let me show, well, you've already, uh, in a different webinar, um, how to record using Blackboard is already discussed, and it's kind of integrated into here. I do just want to show you um, Ensemble Anthem really quick and also show you OBS. So I will screen share again. Let's see. screen share the correct screen this time. Let's see. There we go. Screen two. All right, cool. So um, Ensemble, basically, you just go to stetson.ensemblevideo.com and log in. And it's really, really simple. It just looks empty. If you press record, which I'm not going to do, if you press record, it will start a video recording, and then it will automatically upload it into this library. So then you have a library of recordings that you can share. Um, so Ensemble Anthem is the software. The reason that I recommend Ensemble Anthem over Blackboard is that if you download this software, here's a tutorial, if you download the software, you can actually customize this a bit better. So you can select a different webcam. You can select a microphone. You can do screen sharing and use your webcam. Um, and you can do some basic editing. So I really, that's more customization than I see out of Blackboard. I might be wrong about that. There may be better customization that I'm not aware of. Uh, and thank you for that uh, ensemble instruction link, Mike. Um, for me, that's not enough customization, so I use software that's called OBS. And uh, let me just show you that really quick. Uh, so I'm going to screen share. Uh, actually, I'll just open it up. So, all right. So whenever you have OBS open, uh, you can control separately uh, if it's going to show, hi, <laughs> if it's going to show your webcam, a webcam and the desktop, and you can move these things around, uh, which I really like having the option of putting myself in different parts of the screen. Um, and you can also just show your desktop. So I'll often do something where I'm talking, I'm showing some software over here, up here on my screen, and then I'll play a video or something, and I'll just click this to go away so students don't have to look at me while a video is playing. Um, you can also see that you have the, um, I can separately control the, uh, the volume coming in on my microphone and then the volume coming from my computer here using uh, these two things. 
So OBS also has more robust control for streaming and recording. Um, it's a little bit more of a learning curve, but if you're interested, I'm happy to talk with you about OBS because I, I think it's great, actually. Uh, let's see. All right, let me stop screen sharing for a moment. Okay. Um, and really, the what professionals would do for this uh, with making a lecture video is you would use separate high-quality cameras, separate microphones. You wouldn't involve a computer at all. You would shoot everything, and then somebody would go into an uh, editing program like Adobe Premiere Pro and edit it all together. I don't recommend that you guys learn to do that unless it's something you're just really interested in <laughs> for yourself. Um, OK. Kathy says Ensemble allows you to do self-record and screen share. That's great. So there is some functionality within uh, Blackboard and Ensemble to take care of this stuff instead. Um, next, uh, let me, yeah, OK. So I'm going to show you some of my uh, videos that I've made, uh, or just the basic idea of it. So let me screen share again. So first of all, what I decided to do is to uh, to make each of my videos. OK, hold on here. Uh, so within my uh, Blackboard course, uh, I went ahead and prepped my course for next semester just because I was tired of thinking about it and decided I just wanted to get it done. And um, let me make this easier to see. So I. Um, I have my syllabus as a Google Doc. And then within the syllabus, um, I give all the links to the different tools I'm going to use. So I give links to my YouTube page. Um, and I also give links to Microsoft Teams, to my class team, and also to the SharePoint folder where students are going to turn in their content. I just want to show you what my YouTube playlist looks like. So I've made a playlist for each of my teaching videos. Um, let me play a little bit of one. Sometimes YouTube is fussy whenever you're trying to play it uh, and stream video. So I recommend you test that beforehand. See if it'll let me, it may not. There we go. So I made a little intro just because I'm a video audio person and I just felt like it. But obviously, you don't need to do anything like this. But I made uh, a little intro, and then I have my lecture start. All right, so let's talk about Mixer. So with Mixer and basically, I have a PowerPoint that I'm talking through, and then I'll often pull up examples online. I'll pull up different pieces of software and talk through it. Often when I'm doing these lecture, video, lecture videos, I'll do it synchronously, meaning I'll have it streaming live via YouTube or Blackboard or whatever. And then I'll also simultaneously make a recording of it. Um, but doing it this way gives me a lot of functionality to switch between pieces of software and to get the highest quality of video and audio possible. Um, anytime you're using a different um, a program like Ensemble or Blackboard, it does it can change the um, it can change the functionality and the quality of the the video and audio. So like right now uh, on my screen, or let me pull up. Uh, well, right now in my video, I'm down here in the corner. It actually cropped my video because of the way that Blackboard works. And I didn't know that it did that <laughs> until I tested my video, right? Um, my videos are kind of long. Hala asks, how many uh, minutes is each video? Mine are like between 30 minutes and in over an hour. It just depends on the content. The shorter, the better, uh, generally. Um, and I also just want to encourage you guys to make a space, make a teaching space that works for you and that integrates your streaming setup. So like here's my uh, teaching space that I'm at right now. I have two monitors, so I can have different content on both monitors. I have speakers already set up, so I don't have to wear headphones because I don't want to wear headphones while I'm teaching. Um, I have my webcam that's right here, and it's just always set up. I don't have to move it. I don't have to plug it in. I don't have to remove it. 
And then I have my mic set up right here that I can just turn on really easily. I also have my external hard drives and stuff over here so I can save stuff really easily. And I buy a window. I also um, made sure to stage a couple of things in my video. Um, let's see. All right, so we're back. So you should be able to see my camera. Okay, so if you look at uh, my camera, I made sure to one thing to keep my uh, camera at eye level. And I also wanted to have uh, light coming in and hitting me on the side, not just backlighting me. It makes you look like a serial killer or something if you only have light coming from behind you. And then I also wanted to have some, uh, some of my music stuff, some of my artistic research work behind me to show that like, yes, I am a, I'm a person that does this stuff uh, professionally. <laughs> Um, the tripod is very useful so that you can, I have a hard time clipping my, my webcam onto, um, onto something to make it height, but I just got this very cheap, uh, tripod. Um, I'm just going to look through the comments a little bit to see if I missed anything. Woo flashy. Yeah. Uh, lighting is a big issue. Absolutely. Um, Missy, uh, I did just make a YouTube account so that I could do a playlist. Um, that's free. Also, to use um, streaming on YouTube is free, and it's actually really, really powerful. It's um, more powerful than any of the streaming software that we have access to professionally, <laughs> and that's because it's made for like professional content creators, musicians, artists, etc. And I actually I recommend uh, YouTube and Twitch as the best streaming platforms in terms of encoding quality and resolution. Um, <laughs> Leela says, uh, move your coffee cups. My cups are very specifically put right here. I want them exactly here. And they're not going to spill on my stuff. They never have. I say that. But uh, <laughs> um, I like that they're not in my shot also. So you don't see me just holding my cups all the time. Um, but I like to drink them all the time. Um, I, Brittany, I will suggest a webcam uh, here in a sec. Um, Heather asks, uh, can you talk about the features of Teams you really like and why? Yes, I would love to talk about that next. Um, so I guess my my basic thing, just to make my last point about all of this video and audio stuff, is that be intentional. So you can use different cameras, you can use different microphones, you can set up your space the the way it is for you as the user, as the teacher, and the way it looks behind you. You can set all of that stuff up. If we're going to be teaching online. Make this a pleasant experience for yourself and for your students. It does take some work, but um, but yeah, it's a set like Brittany's talking about. Absolutely. So let me pull up my team, my Microsoft Teams site, uh, and I want to show you some of the cool stuff that I'm doing in Teams, uh, the cool functionality. Okay, so I'm going to share this screen. All right. So uh, this is my team for one of my courses in the fall. Um, Right now, there's not much going on because I just posted the class syllabus. One thing that I love about Teams is that uh, the files. So this file um, folder can be linked up with um, basically anything. Uh, so you can sync it and you can open it within SharePoint. So actually, what I'm doing is I have a, um, a SharePoint folder that's synced to my computer. Um, and I have, I'm going to have all my students turn in all their work on the SharePoint folder, not on Blackboard. So there's never going to be a problem with uploading anything or downloading anything from Blackboard. Just take it out of the equation completely. Because I, <laughs> we have to do a lot of that. Like we're moving gigabytes of data around all the time in my courses. And it's a huge inconvenience. So basically, instead of that, I make a folder on my computer. And um, I make a folder for each of the projects that I'm assigning. Um, so these are all projects they have to complete in audio software. In each of those projects, I include a rubric, and I include the description of the project. And what I ask them to do is, um, in their user folder, they turn in their project in a very specific way into this folder. What's awesome about that is they just turn it in on the internet, right? They're like, oh, I just turned my stuff into this folder. This folder is synchronized to my desktop. So anytime a student turns something in, it syncs to my computer. So I don't have to go looking for a file at all, ever, hopefully, again, <laughs> because it's already on my computer. 
So um, you will see some student names. I apologize for that. But here is a, um, hey, let me like grade this out. OK, so here I have a bunch of students. And each one of them has a folder for each of the projects. And then I tell them exactly how to uh, turn stuff into each of these folders. So then whenever, let's say, uh, students turn in content for project one, I'll just be able to look through, OK, here's something for project one for this student. Here's something for project one for this student, et cetera. I don't have to go download anything or anything like that. Um, and Heather, I do use Blackboard, but for my assignments, for actually turning in projects, I use Teams. So Teams is not good at grading. Uh, Teams is horrible about grading because um, it doesn't do cumulatives, it doesn't do averages or anything like that. Um, so Blackboard, the um, I list all of my projects also on Blackboard, but I've removed, uh, I basically, they shouldn't turn it in on here. I give a link to where I want them to turn it in. Um, I do use Blackboard for online quizzes and exams. And um, I'm a bit different because I don't use my quizzes and exams for things that actually count for a lot of points. So I don't actually care. I, I want students to take them as many times as possible just for practice. Um, and then the things that I actually do grade on heavily, the projects, I want all of the files. And I want them to turn it in via Teams into my SharePoint folders. Um, so all of these quizzes are made um, for them to do as many times as they want and uh, just practice for the quizzes, tests, and the projects. And yes, there are large file sizes, as Brittany says. Um, so Heather asks, Missy asks, doesn't it get a little crazy using so many platforms? Yes, that is a criticism that I've had from students, a couple of them, not all of them, but a couple of them. Um, but I really love the way that discussion boards work on Teams. And I love that Teams has instant messaging built into it. And Blackboard, messaging through Blackboard is just so clunky um, that I really don't want to use it ever again. <laughs> Whereas Teams just works like text messaging. Uh, so it's really easy for me and students. Um, Heather, I have not connected Team to One Notebooks, but uh, Madison Creech has done some of it, and it's fantastic. Um, let me pull up one of her. Uh, she shared um, one of her classes with me so that I could see how she was using it. And she did some really cool stuff using the class notebook functionality. Um, she made intro videos. She put her syllabus in here. And she organized her classes by weeks. And then within each week, she posted different content with links um, and posted different uh, content that students would need. Um, basically, the big drawback that Madison found was the grading is not great in Teams. but hosting content and being able to split up students is uh, it works pretty well for that um, let's see okay so i'm gonna sorry I, I know there's just a lot of stuff to talk about uh, i'm sorry there's just so much to discuss um i also use teams for my uh open office hours so i'll just log into a teams meeting uh that any student can join as uh, for, let's say from 3 to 4 p.m., I'm going to be doing my digital office hour. Um, that's really great. They can also just uh, instant message me. I basically use instant messaging during regular work hours. I'm available. Um, and I, I find that students use that quite a bit. They prefer, I don't know if they prefer that to meeting in person or to meeting over video, but sometimes it's just a really small question that they can say, oh, hey, is this is the answer to this A or B? And I'll say, well, you should think about blah, blah, blah. And we can do that uh, interaction very quickly through instant messaging. Um, the last feature that I wanted to discuss is that uh, live streaming. I really um, like the live uh, instant messaging function like we're doing right here. Yay, live instant messaging, because uh, I get a lot more participation from students whenever, if we're listening to their projects, let's say, um, if we have live instant messaging. And I say, OK, everybody, everybody give a piece of feedback about the piece that we're about to listen to. Um, 
it's super useful. And I think I get about 60% more participation in the class <laughs> just by using live chat. Um, so I am a huge proponent of this. I think I might even start using it in face-to-face -face classes in some way. Um, and I am using uh, YouTube for that now. I was using the gaming platform Twitch, but YouTube has better privacy settings. Um, just to clean up any other questions, Kathy said, is it so that you don't have to download them? Yes. The reason I do that whole um, thing uh, with file management is that I have a lot, I spend a lot of time moving data around with students. This takes care of so many problems. Um, let's see, Dr. Skelton said, feedback from my students say they wish there would be some consistency in platforms. Learning multiple platforms was difficult for students with the rapid transition in spring. Yeah, absolutely. I got that feedback too. I mean, I basically used the transition in the spring as an opportunity to learn a bunch of new stuff and to set up a uh, a space like this to do things online. Um, I feel like once we get settled in and more used to doing teaching and learning online, that'll be less of a concern. But um, I personally don't want to be told which platforms to use. I would much rather try a bunch of them out and then take the things that I like from the different platforms. Uh, and that comes from me a little bit from being a professional in audio. It's like somebody will say, oh, this is the best microphone, but it's absolutely not. It depends on context, right? It depends on the sound. So like, I think we all have to approach this with a critical mind um, to use these tools in the best possible way. Uh, let's see. Bill asked, uh, he knows I have a Teams link on the left side of Blackboard. Yes, I basically do integrate Teams with Blackboard as much as possible. Um, that is a challenge. Um, but basically, I take as much of the file and project sharing into Teams as possible and just inform on Blackboard. That's all information and grades is all Blackboard's used for. Um, let's see. Yeah, and Kathy's talking about your, uh, we have four different classes and students have to navigate each class with multiple platforms. Absolutely. That's, that's a huge concern. I have, uh, I do have sympathy for that. Um, for my majors, for digital arts majors, I mean, this is what you're majoring in, like being comfortable with differences of hardware and software and making a good video and having good sounding audio and all this is like, this is a part of a big uh, set of critical skills that they need to learn. So for our majors, I think really strongly that they should just uh, get some resilience in, <laughs> in learning how to do this, but it's not the case for, for all students, right? Um, Let's see. So uh, that's way more than enough from me. So I would love to share the floor with Mike again um, for if you guys have any more questions or Mike, is there anything that I talked about that you'd like to add to or correct? No, I think you did great. Um, I was scrolling through uh, the messages to see what was going on while I was talking. And um, there was that question I don't think I directly answered about engagement on discussion boards, if, if points really is the best way to do that. And through a slightly controlled experiment, I can say definitely yes. Um, I, so I have, uh, in the six week course, I have five weeks of discussion board. And on the one week where there is no required discussion board, I posted my own questions and prompts just for fun. Uh, and it's actually a topic that they love. It's about repressed and recovered memories where there's always tons of questions. And I got one post from it. Um, so points is definitely the way to go to get uh, engagement you know, on the discussion board. I have every one of my students um, post all three of their posts. And they're usually pretty good in terms of percentage of it. Um, this summer, the discussion board is 60 points out of 360. So uh, not a huge percentage, but uh, it's enough to get them active on there. And I don't think they hate it. Nice. Yeah, um, I, I did just want to make one other point, uh, which is about the, the whole conversation about multiple platforms, um, which is that we it, it can be not accommodating basically to a student to use for all of us to use different platforms. And let's say they have to deal with 10 different platforms uh, between their four classes, something like Blackboard, Zoom, Ensemble, uh, Teams, blah, blah, blah. And there, there's this 10 things. Um, 
that's definitely not great, right? Uh, it's a bit distracting. Um, but I think about what the other, the possibilities are on the other side of the spectrum. Let's say all of us at Stetson could only use Blackboard for everything, right? Like I, I'm sure I'm not the only one who would tear my hair out, right? <laughs> so I'm, I'm much more glad to have the flexibility, like as somebody who's very entrenched, uh, very involved in using media, I think that flexibility is great because it helps us to figure out how best to communicate and meet our needs using this equipment. Um, so I do sympathize with the students. It's just not going to be, it's not going to be perfect. Like nobody's experience is going to be perfect in this, right? Uh, something else I can add in too um, is about presentations. Uh, we, we both talked about ensemble a little bit. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I know last semester what was kind of rough. We all had, a lot of us had presentations included in our, our uh, course uh, assignments. And I, I know some people just kind of dropped them entirely. Uh, I kept them in my classes and I had students use Ensemble to record themselves for presentations and it worked great. Um, they all uh, figured it out. The, the link I sent in the chat earlier about Ensemble while Chaz was talking about it, that's the same link I sent to my students. They figured it out, they did great with it. There were some little questions and issues, but um, presentations worked really well. The one thing I'm gonna change next semester is to do synchronous presentations. Um, so mm. I'm kind of setting it up with the typical schedule like I do um, during class time so that students can ask questions of each other. That was the one big thing that was missing this semester. There was no Q&A for presentations. Um, but I, I think if you do presentation in your classes, don't drop them. I think they're super important. You can definitely make them work. And I'm just going to play devil's advocate because I am a huge proponent of asynchronous presentations, <laughs> meaning that and my big reason for that is quality, uh, quality of the actual media. So like right now, I have a, um, a $350 microphone plugged into a $1,000 audio interface into my computer, into these speakers. It's like this is a, a pro setup. But the quality of how you hear my voice right now, it depends on how much you, the internet is squeezing the quality out when it gets to you, the quality of your speakers, et cetera. So if a student's trying to present on some audio, like trying to analyze a symphony, and they play some audio and it just sounds horrible, then that like it takes away our ability to even enter into the presentation at all, right? So asynchronous presentations has been a big step toward um, quality for my students. Yeah, totally. Depends on on what you're doing for you. Definitely makes sense to do it that way. Missy said asynchronous means they don't get the in-person nervous experience, which was definitely uh, something I noticed in the presentations too. The presentations were really good. Uh, most of them were really good. So I think increase expectations for asynchronous presentations. <laughs> That's I, true. I, my expectations are pretty high because yeah. I do expect them to be able to handle a bunch of different software and make everything sound and look good. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Let's see, so Harry says, I encourage my students to keep track of the platforms they used, what they did with a given platform and include the use of multiple platforms on their resumes. That's a great point. I actually do that on my CV. <laughs> it says uh, software proficiency and hardware proficiency, and uh, that gets listed. So if you're somebody who deals with technical stuff as a part of your uh, creative or scholarly practice, we do actually do that. Um, so I think that's uh, that makes perfect sense, Harry. Um, maybe just since we have one second, um, I just want to show my syllabus, if that's okay, for one of my classes that I prepped. Um, let's see. Uh, just, uh, just so I can throw it at you guys so you can get uh, maybe some ideas yourself. Um, so I went ahead and prepped a class to be um, half of the class meeting on Monday, half meeting on Wednesday. And then for before every class session, there will be a video or some kind of online activity engagement that they have to complete before the meeting. So in this case, um, here's a review and some kind of video that they're going to have to watch before they come into uh, their different class sessions. The critiques of their projects, um, I'm going to do online via YouTube live streaming. 
so, and I have that set up in, into the schedule. So for me, um, I just had to decide how I was going to split up my class, when and how I was going to deliver content, and then which labs, which sort of active learning uh, things I wanted to do during my actual class meetings. So I basically decided to fully flip my courses and to, um, and to really concentrate on uh, interactive experiences with students in the time that we do have together, however much that ends up being. Um, so I definitely am not an authority on doing that, but I just wanted to show one example of how it could be done. Um, maybe it'll give you guys some ideas about that. Chad, it looks like Megan and Tony had some questions for you too. Yeah, um, I'll answer Tony's first. Uh, Tony asks, uh, how do you give students access to software that's not normal for them to have? Adobe Creative Cloud. So basically, I'm, I'm of the opinion that digital arts, we should require all of our students to have laptops with the with the correct software on it. Um, I'm pushing for that just because the students do better. As of right now, they, they come into our physical computer labs to use our licenses of software. Um, I'm actually advocating that those licenses of software become uh, subscriptions that get given to a student. So like, let's say they take my audio class, then they get a, uh, a subscription to Logic Pro X for the semester. Um, instead of having it on a physical computer. That makes a lot more sense to me. So this is kind of an, an evolving thing. Adobe is expensive, um, but if you guys have a need for it, I think you should, you should ask your dean, you should ask IT for that. Um, not everybody needs the whole Adobe Creative Cloud, to be sure, but um, definitely some of you need some of the software. Um, and Megan asked if I can show my setup. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I'll show my super cool setup. Uh, let's see. I did spend some time on it, so uh, let's see. Here. Yeah. So I have to go through the share thing, share. Application screen. Yeah. So, Megan, here's my set up. And uh, I guess the important things about it being the separate microphone, separate webcam, two screens, and uh, speakers. I also like having a real keyboard, not just like a laptop keyboard and a mouse. I never use trackpads or anything like that. Uh, and I have, yeah, I have strong opinions about all the equipment and stuff that I have. Uh, I hope that's helpful in some way. Photoshop CS5, all right. That's great. Yeah, now all of this stuff is subscription-based, which makes it a lot more of a pain because we have to pay annually for all this software rather than a one-time purchase. Um, yeah. So, Mike, any... Uh, any closing thoughts or things you'd like to talk about? Yeah, I think we covered a lot. Missy, I'm glad you found this to be useful. It's kind of difficult because it's such a big topic and there's so many different tools. Um, I definitely find it helpful whenever faculty members share the, the tools that they're using and what they like about them. Um, but of course, we all have to figure out how to do it on our own, right? Mm -hmm. So um, before we uh, lose people, uh, I want to say thank you, um, Mike and Chaz, and remind folks that now that um, we've had a couple of opportunities for uh, our colleagues to share their expertise, um, if you were to go back, say, to the Brown Center blog and, and review the uh, resources, the links, the online learning links, a lot of those you, you might be able to uh, hone in on a little more specifically and not feel as overwhelmed potentially with all the links. But, uh, you know, 99% of those are video tutorials uh, that are produced by either other faculty who ha have um, taught, created online courses, or 
um, like the tutorials about specific functionalities related to are found in Zoom or uh, Blackboard or Teams. And they, I tried to compile those or organize them in some, uh, to, to some degree of, uh, for easy access. And I also uh, remember um, Heather Evans Anderson was in Jazz and others provided a, a, a pretty impressive compilation of uh, links to any number of, again, specific uh, topics about uh, online learning. So you really, there is a whole library out there if you, um, you know, are more inclined to be a self learner, uh, like I imagine many of you are. Um, and now you can do it with a little more confidence if you were feeling anxious about how to get started with it, et cetera. Great. So, well, uh, thanks for having us, Harry. Thank you. Couldn't do it without you guys. Couldn't do it without. Thank you for everyone who came today. That you, um, we'll be posting the recording 